Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 149th New Social Environment. I am Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC and co-host today for a conversation with Jeffrey Gibson, Amber Jamila Musser, and myself. We are also thrilled to have the poet Eleanor Nowen here, who will read to close today's program. Just a few quick notes before we get started. We'll be recording this gathering for the Rail Archive. If you would prefer not to be seen, you can disable your camera by pressing the stop video button in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you have questions, please write them in the chat and I will call on, to you, call on you to speak during the Q&A or I'm happy to read your question on your behalf. Feel free to introduce yourself and shout out where you're coming from over in the chat to your right. The Rail team will be helping out with tech if you have any questions. Closed captions are available by pressing the custom live streaming service button at the top left of your screen. I believe it says otter.ai. Uh, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape, Canarsie, Shinnecock, and Muncie peoples. And a note that unceded means the land was never surrendered by these native people. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manahata home. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprising unfolding across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McGatty, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, and in response to generations of structural violence against black communities. Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce today's co-host, we would like to take, um, I apologize, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's co-host. Dr. Amber Jamila Musser is Professor of American Studies at George Washington University. She writes about race, sexuality, and aesthetics. She's the author of Sensational Flesh, Race, Power, and Masochism from NYU Press in 2014, and Sensual Excess, Queer Femininity and Brown Jouissance from NYU Press also in 2018. She has an MST in Women's Studies from Oxford University and received her PhD in History of Science from Harvard University and has, had, has held fellowships at New York University's Draper Program in Gender Studies and Brown University's Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. She is also a regular contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. Amber, I will pass the mic now over to you. All right, um, thank you so much, Nick. I'm really excited about our conversation today with Jeffrey Gibson. Um, I'm gonna keep the introduction briefer than it could be um, given all of Jeffrey's projects and renown. Um, but Jeffrey Gibson is a multimedia artist whose practice synthesizes the cultural and artistic traditions of his Cherokee and Choctaw heritage with the visual languages of modernism and themes from contemporary popular and queer culture. Gibson grew up in major urban centers in the United States, Germany, Korea, and England. He received a bachelor's of fine arts in painting from the school, um, oh, sorry, yes, from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago in 1995, and a master of arts in painting at the Royal College of, of Art London in 1998. He's a citizen of the Mississippi Band of the Choctaw Indians and is half Cherokee. He is currently an artist in residence at Bard College and lives and works near Hudson, New York. Gibson's works are included in many permanent collections, and he is the recipient of numerous awards, most recently a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in, in 2019. Um, his work is a vibrant call for queer and indigenous empowerment, envisioning a celebration of strength and joy within these communities. Um, so we're so honored to have you here today, Jeffrey. Um, and I wanted to sort of kick us off by starting by talking about the exhibit that you have currently at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, Sorry, I'm going to read this. Uh, when fire is applied to a, to a stone, it cracks. Um, and so what I wanted to ask you kind of as like a little lead in is basically where you see the place of um, indigenous art in museums now. 
Oh, that's a big question. Um, I, I, I guess if we're looking at the conversation around museums, you know, as they are currently, um, you know, I don't, I don't even know how to begin this. I can start with a few points. One, I realize now my history with institutions and museums has been relatively positive for me as an individual. And for a long time, I think I credited the museums with that. And now, years later, I realized that I really should be crediting the individuals within those institutions who advocated for myself and for my work and who paid attention to what I was doing and um, you know, really used their position to, to bring it into a public space where it could have an audience beyond you know, what I was experiencing before. I think um, you know, talking to other Native artists and, and activists, I think it's, um, it's really changing. You know, I think there's a real desire for um, indigenous run for um, indigenous run programming and indigenous run museums and established and founded institutions. Um, I think that that first person voice is incredibly important and necessary in order for there to be actually just the most engaging kind of programming there can be. Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's about the diversity within the native community that we really all are extremely different and I am coming from a generation that embraced, well, at least the world that I've been a part of has embraced um, a sort of pan-Indian, um, trans-tribal kind of aesthetic. Um, but I do think that the younger generation that's coming up, um, rightfully, is interested in pursuing a more individuated perspective on where they're coming from. You know, not everybody is um, what we have referred to as an urban Indian, like myself, having grown up off of the reservation outside of a native community. I think that that narrative still needs to be told. Um, but I think that another extremely important facet is, is um, the narrative that happens when you're within a native community, when you're raised within ceremony, when you're a part of a, a traditional community and how that kind of, um, you know, navigates itself beyond that, that border, that cultural border. So um, also, I mean, again, there's, I think we are in a big moment of change, but the transition really would be to step away from the perspectives of anthropology, ethnography, um, and natural history, and to fully embrace what happens when we step outside of the cultural traditions so that we can, um, you know, behave differently, really. We can pursue different things because they're not really about cultural practice all of the time, but they are about um, establishing a kind of collective consciousness um, amongst ourselves. So, yeah, that's... I guess yet to be seen how that unfolds, but I think that's the wish. If I may jump in, uh, going to our next slide. So the current show that is up at the Brooklyn Museum right now, um, this is when you enter the first gallery, the first thing you see. And Jeffrey, you were talking about um, stepping away from you know ethnography, ar archeology. span And I, m my question is when you approached when you were asked to do this project at the Brooklyn Museum where you have your own works, but you have them in conversation and in dialogue with objects from the museum's collection and the, of their collection of the art of the Americas. Um, I'm curious what, how that drive worked to, to step, step away from that history. And I also coupled with, from whenever we talked roughly two years ago now, um, you know, I know that you worked at the Field Museum in Chicago and there you had really wonderful stories about working with the objects there and with the staffs there. And I'm just curious how all of that informed how you approached this project specifically. Um, I think, you know, some of the biggest pluses of doing this project was of course having access to the museum's collections. But I think also working with um, Dr. Christian Crouch, who is a historian and who really, um, you know, indulges in reading through archives. I'm a very visually and material oriented person. So for me, a lot of what I was doing 
I really probably had wanted to do this about 20 years ago. So in many ways, getting the opportunity to move ahead 20 years later, um, it's not as if I'm stepping back, but I realized that I didn't need to create something new, that this was some, these, these kind of minor connections are things that have found their way into the, my practice into the way that I think and the way that I work. So it was really just kind of allowing it to kind of happen easily, you know? And so um, to think about, and then, and then to be transparent about what we were looking at, you know? And it's, it's, it's kind of wild to think that that is so significant when you're working with indigenous collections and an artist. But the idea of seeing these objects as collaborators, as having their own integrity, as um, acknowledging them as teachers um, of mine. And, you know, I, I've said elsewhere before, you know, I'm not really somebody who's inventing brand new things. I'm more of like a DJ remixer of like material histories and visual culture. But I'm not really, you know, the techniques that I use in my work are things that I have literally learned from looking at objects or from somebody another native person teaching me, you know? So, um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was great. Um, the piece that you're showing here, the dying Indian, this image has also been with me in a very present way. Um, this kind of image, I shouldn't say this particular one. The Rumsey is something that I had not seen before I started talking to the curator at the Brooklyn Museum. And, uh, but it's the kind of image, turn of the century, dying, dying civilization image that um, during the 20th century, people have come to embrace as some sort of honorable depiction of our strength, you know, the, the kind of weak warrior after fighting, but ultimately we will, we will demise, you know, we, we will um, move into the past and cease to exist. And I think that that, that image, um, it's a very kind of heavy, layered, complex meaning and cultural embrace of that image that I think for someone like myself has had to give over mental space and physical time to try to get out of, you know, to get out of this really small spot. And, um, and the way that I got out or have been getting out is literally to use the language of native people, the aesthetic, visual, material language, process-based language um, of native people. That has been my map to getting out of that small space. And I think um, this piece came together really quickly and gave a lot of structure to the show as to like, oh, wow, I need to make these standalone artworks from multiple things. You know, I needed to do a, a mural that spoke to the sculpture with a frieze that spoke to the sculpture and um, the moccasins that were commissioned for the, for the dying Indian needed to speak to these other moccasins for whom we don't know who wore them, we don't know who made them, um, and we don't know their histories at all. So I think that's been you know, in that small space, it's kind of impossible to let my brain build as equally layered ideas, you know, as equally layered images. So you have to get out of that like small box so that you can breathe and you can kind of reassemble and remix and remake things. So I, I'm, I love this piece, I have to say. Like this is a piece that I think, I don't know if I could have done this 20 years ago to be honest. I don't know if I was mentally there to be able to do this, but the impulse to want to work with collections was there, but due to NAGPRA at the time, it was just impossible. There was no way that was going to happen. And this work, um, I, you know, the way that I kind of read it when I was there, and I also just have to sort of, you know, say to, <laughs> hopefully everyone can see the show. It's on view through January of next year. So um, if you're in New York, it's now open. Uh, if you're outside of New York, it's well worth a trip to the Brooklyn Museum. Um, but a really interesting dialogue between this piece, and I don't know how intentional or not it was, between uh, this work and then the next one, if the slide will go. Um, 
So this sculpture seemed sort of like a reimagining almost, if you will, of that last one. Um, and I know you've been making sculptures similar to this for, for many years now, and it's not, it's not per se a new you know, technique or approach to, to making sculpture for you. Um, but this is something that kind of touched on, and I, I'll probably come back to this a few times, but uh, this concept of indigenous futurism and I know from reading in reviews and from catalog texts, you know, this, this is bit you've been kind of attributed to, to indigenous futurism. And um, I'm really curious to ask you directly how you relate to it specifically and how it, you know, informs how you approach your work and how you consider making things um, mm -hmm. and how that perhaps was part of this exhibition, because there's very much a sense of not just looking at the past, but of course, looking at <clears throat> the past and how it informs the future and the present. Um, so that's, that's my question in terms of your relation to indigenous futurism. Um, well, I think even, you know, before futurism, the hard part for me was even just to feel present, you know, and I think, and, and I'm talking about the last decade of, you know, a lot of performance-based work video and um, painting and sculpture, it was really a struggle to just get my full self to be present. Because I realized that one, even though I was critical of that image of the dying Indian uh, being this kind of demise of indigenous people, I was occupied with it. And occupied in a way where I wasn't, I wasn't actually developing as an individual I was developing as someone responding to a distracting image that someone else had made that represented me in the eyes of other people. So there's this kind of ricochet between how meaning um, develops, you know, and I had to learn that over the course of, I would say 10 to 15 years um, to try to like carve out, um, if I can take this distraction away or if I can somehow harness this distraction enough that it's not occupying me so much what what am i you know what am i if i can take this stuff away and i think that that sort of bringing yourself into the present tense um is the first step of imagining a future right and then it's just sort of dropping your ego and saying okay if this is who i am in the present tense then um it thinking about a future felt kind of like a muscle that you didn't know existed, like this limp atrophied muscle that you were kind of like, well, I don't even know how to like move forward, you know? Um, I knew how to perform like a really functional person. I knew how to perform like a very successful functioning person. Um, I knew how to get a degrees and education, but that idea of being able to really project oneself into the future, um, really just was something that had to be built. So I think this piece was very much about um, speaking to faith, speaking to um, ancestors, speaking to other creative people, and literally asking, like, what do I need to do? Like, what do I need to do to move forward? And these, there's only five of these pieces that were made at this time, it's around 2015. And um, they're, Part of it had to do with like what you're looking at here is like this cloak that is laying over three, uh, I believe it's two, two or three pieces of driftwood. Um, and really the cloak is the body and the cloak in many indigenous cultures is the body. It is the transformative vessel that when you step inside of it, you become somebody entirely different. And so that was the first step was to look at like, um, this idea, it's, it's not clothing, it's not a costume. Like what is this thing that, that we have traditionally put on and what is the one for myself? The words all came through dreams. This one says, speak to me in your way so that I can understand. And um, those words came to me from a figure in a dream that was actually quite um, kind of harsh with me, just kind of saying like, get over it like you're i can't understand what you're saying to me like you need to stop mumbling you need to speak up you need to enunciate you need to let me know you're talking to me and um it was a little it felt like tough love you know so anyway so we jump forward to now um i think the future is um it's it's literally 
trying to project a vision of what we could do, what our possibilities are. And I think my role is just creating space for people around me, behind me, and in front of me to, to be able to move forward. I do feel extremely fortunate um, and, and, you know, lots of unexpected things have happened in my life that I feel like, I mean, the fact that I'm able to make my work and to do projects and to get invitations is, is exactly, you know, um, it's what allows me to do this, to go in and visualize and, and to make things. So I don't know. I think the future, um, I think right now the future is just about offering that experience that I just described that I went through for other people, you know, this like, and, it, and it's hard because, you know, politically it makes sense for us to respond to these conversations so immediately. But from my experience, it's been that you really have to think about when they're serving as distractions from you becoming a stronger you versus when, and, and are they like giving you the space to do that? You know, so. Well, I'm sure we're going to come back to the future a few times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I loved what you were saying um, and sort of, I kind of have, I've, there's so much to possibly say now, um, but I'm interested also in kind of like the unnamed people that you mentioned at the beginning and I think are sort of, you know, hovering around this, this invocation of ancestors um, and people coming to you in your dreams and all of that. And I'm just sort of, um, I think it's really, it's powerful the way your work seems to be bringing them into the future. And I'm, I think I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about how craft um, or sort of like the, these hands-on techniques are maybe part of that, right? Because they're they mm -hmm. seem to be a process um, by which, you know, those who cannot be named are coming through now. I think, you know, it, in, in 2011, I received funding from um, the Harpo Foundation. And um, I believe some other, there were some other funders, and I apologize for forgetting, but um, it enabled me to travel and meet with traditional makers. Um, so I went to Oregon, that worked with people in Oklahoma um, and in South Dakota. And I worked with people who were um, working with hide, people who were doing silver work, making quilts, bead work. And at the time, um, I, I remember talking to people and they would talk about their craft as really life-saving. They would talk about their craft as having the ability to create safety and futures for their entire community. Like, and, and that to me was so um, profound compared to being in Brooklyn, dying for a gallery, you know, like wishing if anything, like if I could just get a gallery, then my life would be sorted, um, which is kind of the model that exists, I think, for a lot of young artists. And, um, and so then that really shifted my brain into realizing that the, the craft was a meditation, it was a prayer. And now that seems so obvious to me when, when people are making things for their communities, it is with a sense of, um, of prayer, you know, and, um, and ceremony. And, and it made also objects that I had remembered seeing previously. Like for instance, I've seen in collections, I believe at the Field Museum, a painter's uh, bundle. And in this pouch, there were the earth paints of the painter, there were the brushes of the painter, and there were songs. And so you would sing these songs with these brushes as you were painting, and suddenly the paintbrush became a ceremonial tool. So all of this, as challenging as it can be for me to think, well, is my paintbrush that I buy at Dick Blick possibly ceremonial? Is there any way that's possible? Or how does this paintbrush work in this way versus this one? And I think um, it was just sort of like, I don't know how to bring those two things together, but let me just try to step forward with these thoughts, you know? And that's what led to craft. And initially beadwork for me was truly um, therapeutic and it was truly a healing time to sit. And I connected that you know, we live in a world where we're all parts of the most minuscule parts of really global transactions. But very rarely do any of us see the beginning of a transaction. Are we with it through the duration of the transaction? And do we see how it resolves? 
how does it impact the people on the other side of the world, this economy that we're all involved in? But with craft, the general practice of seeing in your mind, I'm going to string a bead, I'm going to sew here, I'm gonna loop it back through, I'm gonna to come to another bead. And you do that a thousand times. There is something that is incredibly um, grounding about being able to visualize, do, and complete, visualize, do, and complete. And the complexity of something larger literally has to do with the accumulation of simple gestures. It's not, you didn't do one grand gesture. You did a thousand grand gestures and you made a garment or you made a cloak. And I think for me, that was the, both the physical and the conceptual kind of marrying to craft. And then, um, you know, I have a team that works with me here in the studio. And I think that for the most part, I think that has become, um, you know, we all share some moment in our life where we realized that that's what kind of brought us all into craft. I went forward to the, to the garment. If we want to maybe talk about how, because you mentioned the, you know, your studio assistants and, and all of the, the things that you put together. And I'd love to take a look at the garment here from 2019 and then maybe look at some of the newer works, um, which are kind of coming back to like what you were saying, Jeffrey, about you being sort of this remixer or DJ of these like mashups, and if you will. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about the garment and um, Amber, I don't know if there's something you wanted to say particularly about it. Yeah, um, so I so I was struck when I saw the garments. I mentioned this to you. I mean, there's so much to talk about with them, um, but the, I'll throw it all at you so you can <laughs> take a breath and listen. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that struck me was sort of there's, and I, you know, again, I said this before, but like their similarity in some ways to Nick Cave's sound suits but also their profound difference. Um, and I think some of what struck me as similar why is, is the fact that they do actually make noise, which you can't tell when they're displayed like this, but you do see in videos that you have with people wearing them. And so I thought that was also really interesting, the difference between um, these garments as objects and these garments as actual things that exist in the world as part of, um, you know something else and also just it just made me think about what sort of objects these are and you mentioned it a little bit that they're they're not clothing they're um not fashion and so i just was sort of wanted to elaborate on kind of like what sort of entity this really is um and then i do but we can probably talk about that later but i was also really interested in the fringe um which is just beautiful um well let me see where to start i mean i think I think the garments themselves have existed in my head for some some time, and um, and it wasn't until twenty probably seventeen uh, I started. You know, I was talking to Tracy Adler from the Welland Museum, and she asked me about fashion, and I immediately had a response. I said, "Well, it's not fashion. It's not fashion. You know, it it really has to do with, um, I guess, a couple of things. One, having had the experience in 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 indigenous collections." to be able to look at these garments up close. And imme immediately, you know, you smell like the, the smoking, the tanning of the buckskin. You, you feel the weight of a dress that's like 65 pounds, you know, when it's fully beaded on the front of the yoke. Um, the, you see the child's version, you see repairs, and it just has a very palpable presence of someone having worn, having worn it. And you also realize that it's wrong to desire to put it on in the same way that you might want to put on something pretty. You realize that this is a garment that was made for somebody um, by somebody specific for a specific purpose. You know, it wasn't, you can't go to the store and buy it. And um, so I think the garment for me kind of followed those cloaks of the sculptures which also followed the adorning of the punching bags, which have their own bodily presence. And, um, and all of the material that I generally work with, uh, most of it comes from vendors that you would find at a powwow where um, dancers are buying materials for their own regalia. So I think I was also really, um, 
you know, I've known about the ghost dance movement for a long time. Ghost dance movement being in the late 1800s, um, coming from a vision of somebody, it was a pacifist movement that there were, if you make this shirt and if you dance in this shirt through prayer and through ceremony, they would protect you from, quote, the white man's bullets. And, um, and then of course, there were people who did this and who still were shot and died in their ghost dance shirts. And I was actually um, just really impressed with um, what kind of faith it takes to think that this shirt and dancing is going to save you from a bullet and how that relates to our own relationship to guns and to violence and faith um, to, in the world we live in today. Um, and then also um, Wovoka, the, he was a self-proclaimed prophet. He, um, there's reason to believe that he was actually inspired by uh, Mormon undergarments um, and also garments of faith for protection. And then I started looking into other kinds of um, faith-based garments that were meant to be worn for protection. So even, even within um, the Catholic church, um, the kind of, um, the garments that are worn there and the idea that they are decommissioned once they're worn. So this power of things that I wouldn't call fashion um, are what led me to finally create a pattern. Um, they're all generally made from the same pattern. They're originally made to fit me. So they're actually quite large. The one you're looking at here, I think arm to arm is going to be about six feet wide, um, possibly even eight feet wide. Yeah, I believe it's eight feet wide. Um, and then this is probably, I'm gonna guess about not almost 10 feet long to the bottom of the ribbons. And I think the first one was like kind of impulsive, but then when I put it on, it's, it, they're heavy. Um, you can't move freely. You really have to like pay attention. You have to support the garment. Um, you have to carry the garment with you. And um, there's many things you can't do in the garment. On the other hand, there's things like you start moving your shoulders, you start hearing the sounds of the paragords rub up against each other, the bells start making sounds, and you start realizing like, oh, if I move really slow, can I silence the bells? And the answer is no. There's no amount of slowness or stillness that silences the bells. Your breathing will make, make them move. And, um, and then so since then, they've literally just, um, I started thinking about, you know, I, I I indulge in these materials, so these, this color palette, these, this beadwork, um, the kind of body morphing possibilities in the garments. And, um, and I just realized, after, I, feel, I think somebody, maybe it was a student even said to me, they were like, I think if I saw this, I would know a white man wouldn't have made this. <laughs> I, remember, I remember laughing and being like, I guess that's true. I guess a white cisgendered white man is not going to, probably be making this. And I started, a lot of times it takes me time and, and in retrospect, I can kind of look at something, but I think part of my process is kind of docking that, that part of my mind when I go into creating and making. Um, and I realized I was like, oh wow, this is totally for a queer, I'm gonna say indigenous, but ultimately based on my community, it's not entirely indigenous. I, I love seeing many people put these on and um, how people move in them. So, but um, yeah, so that's, that's, and then as you're seeing it here, I think they work incredibly well also as banners. I mean, this one was made for the biennial, so I knew how it would be viewed and I knew that I wanted people to be able to read the text from a distance. So those sorts of things influence choices, but for the most part, um, and then people like us, um, I've, I've titled a number of pieces, people like us, um, but really this is again, meant to be like, if you're wearing this and you're walking around, what that says about people like us, are you speaking to other indigenous people, other queer people, other people of color, um, who are you talking to? I have the random odd question. Mm -hmm. um, are those potatoes? No, they are pear gourds. They're, de they're um, dried out pear gourds. So they have like the seeds inside of them too. Gotcha. Okay. That's just pure curiosity. Yes. Um, I, do, I do have like a kind of an idea of moving to some more recent works, but Amber, I don't want to move on unless you're sort of ready. I, before no, you we do. Okay. Um, 
I want to, so I want to mention, it's been really interesting to see how these kind of garment pieces have evolved and seeing more performances over the past couple of years. And um, they also relate to, so in the next image here, just a second. So first I have to ask, are these considered like quilts to you, Jeffrey? Yes. Yeah, I consider okay. them quilts. So I kind of recall, you know, talking about this two years ago, and it's really interesting to see them now. And I, I love the, and I know that this is kind of reciprocal because it's also in the garments too, where there's this sort of um, self-referential self -referential nature to um, the materials that you're using, where they're, they're images and text of things that you've used in garments and things from past works. And I'm really curious how, how that process came about. And it feels very much like that sort of um, artist as DJ, kind of like you were saying, like this is a bit of a remix and it requires, it's, it's a continual process because it requires all of these things that you've been doing for many years to, you yeah. know, become this. Hmm. Um, I'm curious how, how that sort of style evolved and how you decide to do that with a quilt as, as compared to a garment. Because another thing that was interesting in the Brooklyn Museum show is seeing um, some text on the garments there that had like a, like a news, news line, like a headline that said, uh, tribes file suit to protect bears ears. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you decide on the things that refer to you and things to, that refer outside of you and how, how do they appear as either quilts or garments to you? Well, you know, part of, part of what I try to do is to not, um, kind of, I don't look at historic collections and try to think about what an authentic design is mm -hmm. or what an authentic really anything is. Um, I try to um, look at, again, where I'm at, what I have around me, and what is it that I can kind of remix at this point? Because I know that I've brought so much, so many things into my life already. Um, and so with the quilts, um, I think part of my kind of interest in painting with geometric abstraction really comes from the way that quilts are pieced together. It's one of the things that I've looked at for a long time. And um, also when I was looking at, um, when I was talking again with Tracy Adler, and we were talking about me making garments, I felt like I had to come up with my own iconography. And it felt like such a performance for me to sit down and develop iconography that could exist on these garments. And then I realized I was like, wait, hold on a minute. I'm an artist. I've been making work for 15 years and it's all been photographed. That is my iconography. I don't have to invent it. And so I started just producing and having um, fabrics printed from those files, from those digital files. Um, and then I realized, you know, if we look at the detail on the left here, um, that is MX Oops and Xavier Ryan. And they are two people who I've worked with a couple of times. That's a photograph of them wearing the garments. Um, again, I told you I've used the word people like us many times. This is the fabric that um, has those words in it. There are also um, images of artworks in here from 2016, um, some oil on hide pieces. Um, I can see Stand My Ground, I believe. I'm trying to think what else is in here. There's other things in here that show up. The quilting is actually um, by a uh, quilter up here named Robert Bemis, Robert Berman, sorry. And um, he is a quilter who I contacted because we were trying to find someone who could do um, quilting that was not sort of like running it through a template, like it wasn't a totally digitized version. And, um, and he's amazing. He, he basically draws with a quilting machine and he takes inspiration from our conversation. So you'll see things like skulls and jingles and insects, spiders, spider webs, bricks, things that he sees when he's here. Um, so he's really done um, all of the quilting. And you can see here in the center, so this is a young woman who's been photographed. If we go into the next kind of ring, again, moving out from the center, this is Anana. She lives here locally in Hudson. This yellow figure is one of the very first medium-sized figures that was in a show at Mark Strauss, probably in 2015. 
Um, and then we get into um, they want are probably those those are things that um, were part of a, a fabric design for a performance um, to name another. So you know, originally it started literally with just working with the scraps that we had around the studio. Um, and then now sometimes I will just, you know, design a fabric and have it printed. But I think in that way, I just think there's this kind of DNA that flows through everything and I start seeding a new piece with pieces that we already have around the studio. Um, and yeah, that's just how I work. Amber, did we want to look at some more specific pieces too with Fringe? Um, well, I was actually going to ask about um, collaboration yeah. more broadly. And I think that there, because you've mentioned it a few times, and so you can kind of think about it in relation to collaborating with like the unnamed um, people, but then also you have explicitly named collaborators. And I think that there's also, and I'm curious sort of like how you would put that on par with say acquiring materials from the same people who are supplying um, materials for people gathering things for powwows, right? And just sort of, I think that question of kind of where people are taking in from and sort of, um, I'm just sort of curious about how collaboration is working for you, I guess. Um, it's funny, I think because um, again, this time when I was traveling and I, um, well, one experience that I had was when I was on Pine Ridge and I would meet with an artist um, who was making, you know, they had no idea who I was. They get a phone call from me and I say, hi, you know, we know so-and-so in common. Like they, they suggested we be in touch and you might be interested in working with me. And um, a lot of these people are, they sell what they make on the, on the road. Uh, driving, if you're driving around Pine Ridge, you might see somebody selling things um, on the road. And, um, and I wanted to have these kind of like grand conversations about creativity and making. And I would approach them and they would just kind of look at me like, well, do you want what I'm selling or not? And I you know, had to kind of like break it down and kind of say like, well, listen, um, cause they said, I don't make any, this, this came up more than once. So I'm not trying to generalize, but more than once someone said to me, I won't make anything that that has to sell for more than $35 because nobody will buy it. And it, I totally understood it. That's the mindset of somebody driving through the reservation saying like, oh, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy something while I'm visiting this native community. Um, and so I had funding and I said, well, what if I could buy it from you for up to $1,500? What would you, where would your brain go? Like, what would you wanna make? And that opened up a really different conversation. Um, and um, eventually, I felt my best role in that situation was to step out of the picture and not to try to direct them as to what to make, but just to commit to paying them for their time and their labor and to call it a commission that would be incorporated into a sculpture in a show in New York. So that, that was how that first one worked. But, and I know everybody really wanted to call them collaborations and I felt full transparency that I had to acknowledge them as commissions. They were not collaborations. Mm -hmm. And since then, I felt committed to try to figure out what does a collaboration look like for me? <clears throat> and I'm not a great collaborator, to be quite honest, when someone has asked me to collaborate um, because I don't know how to compromise my vision. Um, so in turn, I don't ask anybody to compromise their vision. And I, when I, when I call it a collaboration, I always start off by saying, I make myself available to you to be as involved or as uninvolved as you want me to be. I am happy to be technical support. I am happy to be advocacy. I'm happy to try to look for funding. But um, on the creative end, I brought you here because of what you already do. And my contributions are the garments, the drums, the structure, you know, the space. Like these are my contributions to our collaboration. And now I kind of sit back and let you tell me what works best. So, um, so it really varies, you know. Um, MX Oops is somebody who I've worked with a number of times, performance artist. We just shot some scenes for an upcoming video. Um, and they're just an incredible performer in their own right. So when they perform, they dance to the music that they have made. I don't direct them in movement. I might ask them to do something and then I will let them know 
what I think works best. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, we're shooting a video that's going to ultimately be 15 minutes long. They're probably going to be on screen for two to three minutes. And if we're shooting them for two hours, I know we're going to get something that is totally usable. So, so for me, collaboration is, um, maybe it's just sort of like, you know, getting together and like sort of vibing off of each other. I don't know. It's like, but I, I can't remember the last time when I've really, like, I feel like those lines are pretty firm. It doesn't ever really get that gray, you know? Mm -hmm. So even, for instance, working with editions, I'm working with Tandem Press right now. And even with that, you know, that, that relationship is very unusual to me because they are really willing to put all of their skill and energy and time into realizing what I see. So it, it's like, it's more their knowledge. It's their knowledge and their skill that's being employed. So, I mean, that's, I, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's a very interesting distinction. Um, I, I'm also thinking about it in relation to the term survivance, mm -hmm. which you circulate in the Brooklyn Museum show, um, which it has kind of a, you know, a different kind of valence, but it is still about sort of how to, I guess, like work with the conditions that are given to you, right? Or sort of like how to be with others. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it, how to be with others. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think I'd be lying to myself if I thought we were all coming to the table with, you know, we're not sharing knowledge yet. You know what I mean? You're coming together and you, we're all operating at different time, time kind of systems and um, different sets of knowledge. And I think, um, I feel like my invitation is my first contribution, you know, and that's not to, to make it valuable, but it's like, that's what I chose to do with this opportunity that someone gave me is to invite people. And then, um, yeah, and then, you know, I facilitate in whatever way I can. This is actually a good example of that for the identify performances for the, um, to name another, this has been performed at Esker Foundation, at the New Museum, and it was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery. And um, this group of people you're looking at here, I met the morning of the performance. We had never met before, and I have about two hours to do voice coaching and to organize them. We do two, maybe two run-throughs, and then we perform. And um, the only difference was at the Esker Foundation, we did meet the previous night for um, for dinner. We had a dinner where we did all of that. The next day we came together and did the performance. But that, you know, part of it is, I feel like if it was stretched out longer than that one night, that adrenaline that you can stir up in one afternoon of the majority of them are strangers not having met, those nerves, if you can get those nerves to turn into volume, if you can get those nerves to turn into like shoulders back and march with confidence and intention, like people can sustain it for one afternoon and they get to feel what it feels like for that one afternoon. Um, so yeah, I, I, for those I'm surprised, but the one day really does work. I wanted to ask you, uh, Jeffrey, about uh, speaking of collaboration, I was really intrigued by this collaboration that you did in 2018. Mm -hmm. And it felt very, um, striking and it felt really like a nice i don't mean to say a nice but a proper day to, to yeah be. um i am curious if you could talk a little bit about this text or the the making of this um i know that it was in it was in uh collaboration with robert's projects in los angeles mm -hmm. um it, it was interesting to me because uh, I haven't, I feel like I haven't seen many collaboration text pieces and you have a lot of text pieces, you know, your paintings yeah. and all. And I know you're kind of like an author in a way of those. Um, but how, how did this itself come to be? How did it materialize? Was it just in a printed book or did, were these printed? And yeah, it was, it was in a printed book that accompanied a series of uh, paintings on Hyde um, actually in Miami in 20, it's been 2017 or 18, I can't remember exactly. 
But, um, but yeah, Demian is somebody who um, I have so much admiration for. And I really think that they are an incredible writer. And um, it, was, it was honestly, every time I approach somebody, I don't always expect them to say no, but I don't always expect them to say yes. You know, I usually approach somebody when I really am so into whatever it is that they do that I know I can hand over the reins and just sort of be, get to kind of come along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in fact, actually I did a series of digital images and then Damien, I sent them to Damien, I sent a couple of ideas and ultimately they came back, they are the final designers, artists of these pieces and the writing is, is entirely theirs. Um, and I was thrilled that they wrote something new um, and I was really happy with the images and they, they're meant to exist as double page spreads. Mm -hmm. And it kind of ties back in a way too to this uh, sense of like a, of an indigenous futurism with this decolonial fantasy. Um, I was really intrigued by that one because it's yeah. the cover of like a comic book of sorts, you know, with a 1492 sticker price. Um, Amber, did you have anything on, on this end? Sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm not going too far. No. No, you can keep, you can keep going. OK. Um, I'm jumping around a bit in the slideshow. So give me just one moment. But I do want to make sure that uh, we, I know that I'm keeping an eye on the time. And uh, I want to make sure that Sorry, everyone, just a second. I want to go back to some of the text pieces. Um, so these are some of the newer ones. Mm -hmm. And I believe everything that we received was from 2019. Um, yeah. And trying to think of, of what are all the, the most recent works. Um, what, uh, I guess, yeah, what, what would you like to say about this, the, the newer text works and like how you're calling uh, the text from those? Well, this, I feel horrible. I can't remember exactly where this text is from. All the things that we should have said, I believe, oh gosh, it's from a song. And I Was feel it bad Joni that. Mitchell or? It is, it is Joni Mitchell, yes. It is Joni Mitchell. Um, and, you know, that's not unusual for me. I listen to a lot of music and I, I'm always like, when something like peaks, and I could listen to the same song every day of the week for a full week and it may not hit me until like next Monday, you know, that there's um, a phrase in there that, that um, is kind of like um, speaking to me. But with these, um, well, it has to go back actually to 2018 um, and the show that I did with Sycamore Jenkins. And it was the first time where I really just wanted to return to painting. Um, I had been working on Hyde and I realized Hyde at this scale is, it's not impossible, but it is really, really challenging because the Hyde really does its own thing. Um, and to get it this large, it gets really unmanageable. So I wanted to go back on canvas. Um, I knew that I wanted to do these, um, these beaded frames. Um, I knew that I wanted to indulge in um, pattern and decoration and op art and text. And I was really looking for this like super flat quality of color, but having like the color kind of move up against each other. And so, um, yeah, so we did that show and I was kind of surprised myself because I loved the show and I loved the paintings. And, you know, whenever I finish a work, like I love it if I look at it and I say like, I would want to own this, like I would want to live with this. Mm -hmm. And these paintings for me, um, especially compared to things like wool and beadwork and, you know, cones and metal sewing, like I was worried that they would feel so kind of, um, kind of unemotive, you know? And I think what I didn't expect was that they would feel so kind of loud and purposefully loud. Um, and I really loved that about them. And I think they have a quality of the things that I respond to when I go and I watch um, dancers in Apollo circuit and they're so colorful and they're so 
kind of attention grabbing that um, I can't take my eyes off of them. So um, yeah, so this series of work um, that's been going on now for a couple of years and um, I'm really glad that I went back to painting. It's my training as, as a painter. And now the painting has shifted in the way that I think a, a bodies of work of painting should. Um, so it's interesting, this, this aesthetic that you're looking at here has now become a kind of DNA of a new body of painting. So, and it, and it has kind of grown and deepened. Um, so that's what I'm working on now, actually. I have like, two, um, I don't even know if they're follow-ups exactly, but I'm sort of, I'm interested sort of like, I know that your practice is drawing from songs that you hear, but I think more broadly, I'm interested, and this is, I know I'm sort of borrowing from Nick's questions, but from, for the question of hybridity um, yeah. and just sort of like how, I mean, we've talked about it in different ways in terms of collaboration, commissions, um, you know, the past and the present, but it feels like there's something about the flatness here that's sort of like really in some ways like emphasizing the power of what emerges from this, this yeah. type of form. Um, and so I guess relatedly, I'm really interested, you mentioned um, the loudness of the suits and the sort of getting people together and increasing volume. So yeah. I'm just curious about your relationship to loudness. Um, well, <laughs> just sort of like, as a, like, is it an ethical practice? Is it what we should, we should we all be trying to be loud? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if we should always try to be loud. I think I kind of move back and forth between like really loud and really quiet. In fact, I know I do um, physically. Um, you know, I was like that high school kid whose like car was like thumping as it came down the road because my bass was too, was going too hard and like my volume was too high and I'd pull up to a gas station and be embarrassed and have to turn down my radio before I open the door. You know, and, um, and now that I have kids, I, I always realize that like, oh my gosh, am I ruining their eardrums? And I look in the rearview mirror and like, luckily they're like bobbing their heads and I'm like, okay, cool. My kids are going to know a beat. They're going to know some bass. It's good. Um, I love drum and bass. I love jungle music. I love that kind of feeling on your body. Um, and I love that it collects us, you know? Um, I love that a DJ collects us and kind of takes us on a magic carpet ride into the night. And I remember like um, being at, you know, different different clubs in the, in the early 90s where, you know, you're all dancing so hard and you're sweating. And then I used to go to this club where it's like, at three in the morning, suddenly the DJ would just like bring the music to like a, almost like the most mellow, chill drone sound. And then the lights would rise up and we would all look at each other, totally sweaty, total strangers. You had no idea who it was. And you just kind of stopped and saw each other. And then it would like, the lights would come back down and then the, the, the sound would go back up. There's just something, um, sound is like, it's, it, it is, I think to experience it physically, is um, wonderful, wonderful. And I think the visuals that accompany that kind of loudness, um, I guess, yeah, that I, I think of it as intensity. You know, sometimes I think about, that's a word that I, I use a lot is, is intensity. Um, but it's also that relationship between something that's like so plastic to something that's so handmade and something that's so loud to something that's so quiet. Like, I, I think, I don't really have a preference between the two. I just wouldn't want to live without one of them. I want to mention something uh, before, before we do shortly go to the Q&A. Um, things I wanted to make sure I said. So I did put in the chat, um, speaking of Demian, uh, it, they are a part of a group called Rise Indigenous and I really recommend everyone to follow them on Instagram. Um, so had to say that. I also really wanted to ask Jeffrey about, um, so the video that you did 2014 to 2018, One Becomes the Other, where uh, it, there was a really interesting connection of that video to now for me, because, you know, there are these people within the, the collections of the, of the museum, and I felt that there was this interesting parallel to the Brooklyn Museum show of, of interacting with a collection of a museum. And I noticed that um, one of the main characters or, or one of the main performers from that video was part of, sorry, I'm skipping ahead here, but part of a project that you did just last year called She Never Dances Alone. 
and actually moving back here too, um, and how these things relate to each other, uh, this, the text of this work in Numbers Too Big to Ignore, um, I thought was a great segue to this performance because the jingle dress uh, dance uh, specifically was dedicated to the murdered indigenous women mm -hmm. um, and unnamed indigenous women. Um, I wanted to ask because I just thought it was a really fascinating connection of how this is connected in a way to the Brooklyn Museum show. Um, if you could kind of talk about how this materialized and um, going back a little bit too to collaboration, um, you know, it's it's interesting to see you working with the same performer or dancer, Sarah, here. Um, so how do you kind of maintain those relationships over time? It's totally out of respect and admiration. I mean, I think um, like Sarah, I knew when I was introduced to her when I did the video it, in Denver, um, One Becomes the Other. And um, John Lukovic, the Native Arts Curator there, is the one who invited me to do a project um, and help facilitate the production of that video. Um, he introduced me to Sarah and she was just, you know, she's somebody who is so present. Um, and I'm going back to the way that I described being present earlier. Um, and she's somebody who is really kind of very direct in her intentions about imagining a future. Um, in fact, the video that we shot for One Becomes the Other of her, there's a scene of her um, dancing inside the museum. And we thought when Times Square asked me about doing a project, I thought I could use that video. But in fact, it was just, it was not the right angle. It was not the right um, uh, quality of video to project. And so we brought Sarah back here to the studio and we set up the studio and um, filmed her, videoed her in, the, in my, my studio dancing. And then we did the editing from there. The image you're looking at here is her um, dancing live at the opening on March 7th, just before we all began quarantining. Um, and she, she brought her family, um, her sisters, her mother, and she was so um, determined and proud to dance in honor um, and to bring awareness to missing and murdered indigenous women. And she's the one who chose the handprint across her face. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is all her regalia. And yeah, she's just somebody who I feel like now I know that um, she's somebody who I, I imagine will work together again in the future. Um, and you know, I always, I always wondered, like when I was younger, I was like, how does that happen? How do you end up with this crew of people that you keep returning to? And that's how it happens, you know, you, you, um, you give each other, she gives me the ability to be able to involve her um, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so does MX. And right now I'm working with videographers again and sound people. Um, Joan Henry, you can see in the lower left-hand corner here, is somebody who I met um, during the new museum performance and then asked her to come and do um, opening remarks and a land acknowledgement here in Times Square, which was incredible. So yeah, you, it's just this kind of community of people who I think share this interest. Thank you. And I feel like I want to like present the rose to Amber of like ending on that note of sensuousness. And um, I, I just want to say too, I put the link to the video of this and a few others in the chat. And I really, truly highly recommend everyone watch the video because uh, at least experiencing it that way, you get a, a better idea of it, and um, it's well, well worth your time. Um, but yeah, Amber, any any closing remarks or questions from you before we head to Q and A? I feel, man, I feel like I'm like going to disrupt the flow. Um, no, no, but <laughs> given given that it is um, Indigenous Peoples Day, right? Um, I, and when we were sort of talking about setting up this conversation, uh, one of the things you mentioned, right, was sort of like this movement from land acknowledgement to land back. Yeah. Um, and I was just sort of curious if you, you know, and given that we've been talking about collaboration and all these ways of working together, um, if you had sort of thoughts on what non-Indigenous people, you know, how non-Indigenous people can better engage um, in ethical ways, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think um, this whole idea 
Well, a couple of things. One, a big shift in my career was the day that I decided I wasn't going to feel it was my responsibility to educate people anymore about how to look at my work. Um, I decided, I was like, you know what, all of this information, all of these histories are out there. Um, if people aren't just making the decision to pursue it on their own, I'm just going to move on and find the people who have done some of that work enough for me to feel challenged and to feel um, respected, you know? And I feel that way even about myself in relationship to other communities. You know, there's so much information out there. And I don't think any of us should accept that we have the privilege of it being spoon fed to us when we encounter one of these environments. This land um, has an entire history of original inhabitants and people who are trying to return practices and return culture to this land that we are all on. And um, it's important to acknowledge that. And that's the beginning of the conversation. I think the land back movement is interesting to me because you know, when we say um, the unceded lands, we're ultimately saying that, okay, so what happens next? And like, it is a big leap, but what are the steps? What are, what are the things that can facilitate any version of that or can continue the conversation? It's incredibly uncomfortable, you know, it's incredibly uncomfortable, but I think it's, um, it's necessary for all of us to um, be okay with our discomfort and, you know, I lived through the 90s when the political correctness really stopped conversations in their tracks and everybody was so scared to say anything to each other for fear of offending each other. It's fine. Like, I would rather, I would rather be asked the question than to sit, like, in the performance of silence. You know, it is such a demoralizing thing for people to pretend that they're unaware of the impact of, of, not, not just one individual's actions, but really collectively how we operate as a culture. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It just is that. It is just a lot of work, but. Is, um, it, there's no end point. There's no kind of like bullet pointed goals to be achieved. It's an ongoing practice. It's an ongoing perspective on how we, we live amongst each other. And, um, and it's just a lot of work that has to be done every day. Yes, it's a lot of work. And let's make, not just today, but every day, uh, the spirit of Indigenous people say that. Yes. Um, well, I, keeping an eye on the time, I want to I wanna thank you both so much. Jeff, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us today and for taking the time, um, Amber. Likewise, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. Uh, if it's okay with both of you, I think we'll transition to Q&A and take some questions from the audience. Cool. Um, our very first question actually comes from our own Fong Bui of The Rail. Fong, I believe you can activate your mic. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank what you, Fong. Great, great conversation. I'm learning so much about your work now and I, I, you know, you mentioned op art um, in the way in which you mobilize color, and I can understand the the swellingness of it, the vibration of the color through its chromatic spectrum. Uh, but I was thinking also, uh, since you and and Amber talk about loudness at time, and then all the time, somewhat we tweet back to sort of silent and whatnot. And I was thinking whether neo-geo uh, or otherwise neo-geometric conceptualism, that's when I came to New York. I remember seeing a show uh, at Sonnenberg Gallery, a group show in 1986 that includes works by Coons, by, remember Ashley Bickenton? Mm -hmm. Another mm -hmm. figure that's not quite as visible as it used to be, but Peter Haley and others. and. And it was so interesting because it, you know, by um, using geometric abstraction, why criticizing the, the kind of uh, technology or industrialization and consumerism in, in our culture? Technology also was seen as a promise and a threat at the same time. So I wonder how much Neo Geo have any kind of uh, inter 
um, you know, like a dialogue with your work, Jeffrey? Yeah. Well, it's probably around the time, you know, the early, early 80s is probably the time, you know, I was probably around 10 years old at that time. And I think <laughs> when I started um, paying attention to artwork being made, you know, I was living, if I wasn't living abroad, where we had minimal, um, we had minimal interaction with like American popular culture, you know, but if I was living in the US, then um, I was reading magazines and I was looking at artwork and I imagined that the art world that I was looking at was literally this utopic bubble that I was dying to get to. Mm. Uh, I'm sure like many young artists of the time, like New York was the place where I wanted to be, that music scene, that art scene. It was, it was the place where I thought was going to make me feel normal. You know, I wouldn't be the outsider there, but I would be able to kind of move freely around. And so I think, you know, in a, in a weird way, Neo Geo is probably like my backyard. You know, it's like what I grew up looking at and eventually started looking elsewhere. I do think that there's a lot conceptually similar with what those artists were doing compared with what I'm trying to do in terms of trying to connect concept with, you know, with pattern, with color, with what otherwise would be kind of form, just formal decisions. Um, so I do think, I think in that way, yeah, I could see lots of overlap. Cool. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Amber. Um, I actually want to now pass the mic over to GE in the audience. GE, just one moment. You should get a prompt to yes, your yes. Yes. Oh, it's there you are. Uh, Greetings, and thank you so much for this wonderful afternoon, especially with today of all days and going forward. Um, I, I, I've been to some, some um, powwows where they, that they worked a lot into sort of the futurism of things, and, and they've had groups like the Tribe Called Red um, perform, which are very much um, uh, work in a DJ mode and this kind of thing and mixing and matching everything. So I wonder if you're familiar with them at all and have any connection with their with their sound and what they do? Yeah, the Times Square art piece is actually edited to their song Sisters. <laughs> and uh, we did try to get them to Times Square to perform for the opening. Um, that was not possible. They were traveling on tour. But that was actually a Sarah's suggestion when um, she was here in my studio. She, uh, we were listening to traditional songs and then she said, do you mind if I put something else on? And she put on A Tribe Called Red. And I had known about them before that, but that particular song really guided everything, the editing, um, sound, and it will travel with the piece. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, I will be passing the mic over to the Rails' own Anya. Anya. Hi, um, thank you so much for this conversation today. Um, my question comes after um, thinking about the Identify performance um, and also something you said when we were looking at the cloak pieces, this notion that you put people in those cloaks um, who are in your community who are not necessarily indigenous people. Um, and I was just thinking like, it, it seems like you have a very expansive definition of indigenous futurity, which just, which goes beyond simply the identity marker of being an indigenous person, but obviously is rooted in indigenous tradition and epistemology. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak on that vision of a, of a de decolonial, decolonized indigenous future. Um, and it's kind of, is also coming after thinking about land back and, you know, as, as we start talking about what it means to decolonize this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've always kind of grounded my own perspective just in my own experience, you know, and um, so for instance, when I start going down the path of kind of like personally, if I go by the definitions of what we're talking about, about decolonizing, um, you know, for me personally, my own family, my husband is not native, my husband is Norwegian. Our children are, you know, Hawaiian, Scottish, Italian, Puerto Rican, Dominican, um, Irish, that's just the four of us. Um, my mother 
um, is Cherokee for what we know. And we know that there's some, I believe, Dutch on her side of the family. My father is Mississippi Choctaw, but there is a handful of missing branches on that family tree in a state that was known for um, the necessity to pass many times and slavery and plantations of which the Choctaw people were involved. Um, so I think to determine what decolonization means or how I enact or engage cultural specificity in my own life is um, it's a series of really wonderfully complicated kind of entanglements you know so to try to figure out how why well, don't I don't even have a desire to like separate them you know I think it's it's um, and it's not to say that decolonizing isn't necessary but I I think again one of my um, loves of the use of materials by indigenous people is you know and a lot of this for me came from Brazilian culture and um, the idea of the cannibalist manifesto where when an outside material comes in rather than allowing that material to colonize you you immediately transform it into something that supports your own community and your own people. And those are the materials that I'm drawn to within Native community um, and, and makers and material use. So, and I've heard, you know, the idea of those outside materials being described as colonizing. And I think maybe I don't have a great answer for what that means, but I do know what I just described to you. You know, I do know those things and I don't consider them to be colonizing. Um, so I think, you know, the same thing with institutions and museums, to go back to where we started from, do they need to change? Absolutely. Um, there are new things that need to exist in the future that create space for those perspectives and voices. But I can tell you from working on NAGPRA in the early 90s, we can't just disassemble a museum immediately. You know, if we look at the Met as an example, all of those objects that exists there, there is no immediate location for them to go back to. So those mechanisms have to be built. Like, what do we mean when we say something needs to be returned? In some cases, it's much more obvious than in other cases. But until that mechanism is established, there does need to be incredibly thoughtful um, and effective care for those objects in ways that the people for whom they impact do need to be able to visit them. They do need to be able to have say so over how they are handled. But it is really, um, I think we're at the beginning of what hopefully will become impactful um, act, acting actions. Um, but we're still, I, I feel, we're at the period of being enraged, right? We're, we're at the period of demanding change. The next step, of course, is to begin to create those mechanisms that allow for change to happen. And um, I think that requires all of us. It requires all of us. It's not just about indigenous people. Um, and again, I go back to my own family to say, I, I, can't, I can't separate all of those things. So, but that's, yeah, that's my perspective on it. Wow, snaps, thank you. Jeffrey, that was so beautifully said, thank you. Um, the Irish makes sense too because I, when I was at the the Brooklyn Museum, the one the one painting said, I I hope I'm rem remembering correctly, before the devil knows you're dead and before the devil knows you're dead, yeah. And that's a Irish little proverb I grew and, up. With. And so is and so is uh, when fire is applied to a stone, it cracks. It's also attributed to the Irish. I okay, didn't know that. I like how this is full circle. We're back where we started. It always is, Nick. It always <laughs> Um, I think, I think that is a good moment to transition to our poem. Um, but I, before we do, and before we end today's program, I, I just want to, Amber, give you the mic again, you know, if, if any closing remarks from you or from, from your end? I think you're muted. Hold on. Oh, there you are. No, I mean, this is just so wonderful. I 
Jeffrey, I could probably listen to you talk all day, but that's probably not what you want to do. <laughs> it's, it's just everything that you're saying is amazing. Um, and I think it's exactly like what we, I hope that it is a spirit that um, many of us are in to build toward a better future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. We have to. We have no other choice. Um, okay, well, poem time. So it is the Rails tradition to close our daily conversations with a poem. Uh, today, we are very, very lucky to have Eleanor Nowen. I'm gonna read just a very quick bio and I'll pass it over to Eleanor. Eleanor's books include Cars and Other Poems, American Guys, and many others. She's been published in and edited many magazines and anthologies. She lives in New York City with a cat, Lefty, and a husband, Johnny Stanton. She studies Norwegian and trains in karate. And the mic is now over to you, Eleanor. Oh, wow, that was fantastic. That was so inspiring. Color, noise, oh my God, I just loved it so much. So I'm gonna read a short poem a longer prose piece that was inspired by something Jeffrey said in um, an, in an earlier interview in the Royal, and then end with a very short poem. Personal history. I had never been in a city before I packed up my belongings in two paper bags and drove a thousand miles to spend the rest of my life in New York. I was the smartest and dumbest girl in my eighth grade class. Being dumb never got me into trouble, but being smart did every day. When he saw her in a tight teal fish scale dress, he knew he had to spill a drink on her. I come from the prairie. My lies are long. Okay. What home is? I've lived so many places I don't know where I'm from. Everywhere seems like the town I could have lived and died in and maybe did. I was in Otis, Colorado, a town so peaceful the only bar was on the second floor of an old hotel. I am a Mainer, or maniac, and lived three years in Maine's white, bright, unmoving postcard. Like everyone, I was born somewhere, South Dakota in my case. My parents were from European cities, Berlin, Liverpool, and South Dakota was an accident, a refuge, a surprise, but never where they were from. Even though I feel Lutheran, Norwegian, Midwestern, in fact, I'm an urban Jew, but not really since I'm from a small town, a British mother, a German Jewish father, and a past of chopping wood to heat my house. I lived in Michigan where the sky never cleared, so I took acid every day because I didn't know how else to see colors. I lived in Maryland right off an army base because all my friends who I was in love with and still am were in the service. I lived in Colorado, which was the wrong direction, though I didn't know then that New York was possible. I lived in an old Dodge school bus and took my home everywhere I went, but it wasn't. I was on the Florida coast when rockets went up, looking for a home far beyond anything we knew. I was on a lake in South Carolina that smelled more like home than anywhere except the windy western prairie. I was looking for a road in New Hampshire where I once drank birch syrup. I fell asleep one night and woke up under a redwood. I consider Norwalk, Ohio, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Opelika, Alabama home, but everybody there has forgotten me. I got lost in the monochromatic streets of Cairo, but knew my way in a past life way to the wrongly mapped Napoleonic Museum. I believe Buenos Aires exists, although I've never been to Argentina. I believe that if I were forced to leave New York, I would happily scrub toilets in a different language. I'm afraid I still take that school bus everywhere I go. I think about the Arctic more than anywhere else, but I've never been north of Inverness, Scotland. I've been to 49 states, but not Alaska. No one could call me house proud. I said no to the gift of a few acres of land in Maine. I said no to a beautiful old house in Vermont. I said no when I had the chance to stay home and see if I was home. Yellow mustard waving across Idaho, tiny bright pasks on the plains, the shabby irresistible road between San Antonio and the Mexican border, cool Albuquerque, the scary road winding down from Mesa Verde National Park, traffic tickets in Eureka, California, Mobridge, South Dakota, Vaughn, New Mexico, New York, New York, New York, 
Spiral Jetty, Utah, Sun Tunnels, Nevada, Lightning Field, New Mexico. Land art isn't home either. Big isn't home, small isn't home, love isn't home, hallelujah isn't home. The cat clutching a catnip banana, he might be home. And I'm gonna end with a short, thank you, recent, uh, a short recent work, poem. When the war came at last, we were too old to fight. We could only wait behind locked doors for the enemy to burst in. We slipped out at dawn to beg. We ran to the river to see the soldiers in their masks. Were they smiling? Did they see us? Failure left us vulnerable. Our successes left us. We wanted the past to beam on our careless beauty. We had nothing to give as cannon fodder, numbers, gurneys. No one wanted what we didn't have. We slept and woke as old people do. We slept until we were young. Thank you. Thank you so much for this afternoon, everybody. That was blew my mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bye. Eleanor. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. It was a sincere pleasure spending this Monday with you all. Thank you, Jeffrey, for taking the time out of your schedule You're to be with us. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and um, I'm just very grateful for the works you make and what you continue to do. Um, I want to mention very quickly, October is also the Rails, October 2020 is the Rails 20th anniversary. Uh, for 20 years, we have been providing free and accessible criticism and events and conversations and poetry readings and all kinds of things for everyone. So uh, as we celebrate this month, we you know thank you all for being a part of our community and our audience as we continue to do what we do for another 20 years and more. Uh, we have these conversations every day at 1 p.m. Join us tomorrow, please, for a conversation with Sean Scully and co-hosts Deborah Solomon and David Carrier. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Matthew Rohrer. So uh, have an enjoyable day, everyone, and please feel free to unmute yourselves and say hello or goodbye on your way out. Hi, everybody. Thank you. That was all. Thank you. That was Thank awesome. You so Thank you so much. Dynamite. Strong thank you, Adjua. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks Bye. for joining us. Thank you so very much. Thank Be you, well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Really, enjoyed, you. really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Goggles, Fong. For the beautiful reading. Hey, I'll oh, do our beautiful reading. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Thank you. Good to see you. Oh, hey, David. Yeah. Hey, G. It was great, everybody. Hi, Lynn. Hi to Detroit. Hey, thank you so much.